All right, type. Oop. Which one? This one. <laughs> time for us to get started. don't know of any uh, special announcements uh, that we need to make with the exception of I, I will make one. Uh, there's probably not a lot of people in here that will recognize this name, but I know there are several uh, that will. Uh, Shane Scott, who uh, preaches, has preached for years uh, and had thing, has had things kind of rough. Lost his, his wife just a little while back from cancer. He's a young man. Uh, lost his wife and Shane was just diagnosed with ALS himself. So those that know Shane, he's uh, uh, digressing fairly quickly. So, and I know uh, Ralph was greatly distraught over that. He and Shane are probably, uh, or he's probably Shane's best friend or one of his best couple friends. Uh, so Shane has been pretty immobile for a little while uh, because of that and other issues that he has health-wise. But certainly remember Shane in your prayers, if you would. I know that, uh, that he would certainly uh, appreciate that. Uh, so we got that call on one day, and then Bill Robinson Jr., who's a preacher, uh, his daughter uh, has recurring brain cancer, and so I think they've said, you remember what he said, six months, Jude? Four to six weeks. Four to six weeks, okay. So uh, certainly just want to remember uh, the they're like 10 and some, yeah, 10 and 8 or something like that. So uh, certainly if you would remember that family as well uh, in your prayers. Does anybody have any other announcements that we need to make? Yeah, I'm going to go. Good. Good. Glad to hear that about Laura. Let me go to Cindy, then Virginia, and then Marsha. Well, we, and we appreciate that announcement and thankful that the Lord did not allow her to suffer any longer. Uh, who does say I was going to next? Virginia and then Marsha. Did you say Terry? Okay. Uh, so we want to remember her as well. And then Terry, uh, Virginia's sister-in-law, uh, Terry, went to the hospital. Did anybody, did everybody hear that announcement? Went to the hospital with what they believe to be heart issues today. Marcia? kinds of different levels of trauma, aren't there? <laughs> so, no, we certainly want to remember that family as well. And then Ashton. Okay. So, uh, certainly want to uh, remember uh, all of those. And if you uh, if you didn't get those names and you're wanting to write those names down, uh, then just talk to, that was uh, Virginia and Cindy and uh, Ashton and Marcia and the, the ones that I mentioned uh, as well. And then Laura uh, can too, of course. So, let's pray and then we're going to ask Ken if he would after the prayer to lead us in a song and then we'll dismiss the kids to the classes. Father, we're so grateful that you are our God. We know that even when times are tough and people around us are struggling, we know that you are in control, that you care, that you have great concern for your children, and for that we give you thanks. We thank you, Father, for every day that we get to witness more of your glory and your majesty in this world around us. Uh, we are, are so appreciative of uh, the beauty and the power that we see that just testifies as to uh, who you are uh, in this world, and we're grateful for that. 
Uh, we do, Father, ask for your blessings on us in this class, that as we continue to study, may we understand how best to arm ourselves to fight the war that we find ourselves in. And we've had numerous names here mentioned even this evening, Father, which is only a few of those that we know that are on our hearts. Uh, we ask for your special blessings on them. Very mindful of uh, Shane Scott and all those that are close to him with the uh, terrible diagnosis that he just got. Uh, pray that you would allow him to uh, be as, uh, as pain-free uh, as he can be during that process that you would be with. Uh, Bill Robinson's daughter uh, that, and that entire family uh, as they are about to uh, face uh, the tragedy of uh, the loss of her life uh, due to this brain cancer that has come back. Uh, thankful, Father, for your allowing uh, Terry Rush to uh, pass from this life without any more suffering. Uh, we do have others, like uh, as were mentioned with Virginia's uh, sister-in-law and uh, with those that have been mentioned uh, by way of having come out of the hospital, uh, by those uh, of our own number like Laura that are recovering from a surgery, Diane that's got the infection that she does, and uh, we pray, Father, that you would bless all of them. Help us to be mindful of things that we can do or say that would be an encouragement and a comfort to others. Uh, please accept our thanks. Please grant us blessings if you would that allow us to continue to come together like this so that we can encourage and strengthen one another. Thank you, Lord, for who you are, and it's through your Son and our Savior that we ask these things and give this praise. Amen. I'm going to sing number 338. 338. This is a little bit of a new song. Uh, I think I let it once, but it's been many moons ago. So we'll, uh, but it's a it's a it's a lovely song, great words to it, and um, I think it's relatively easy to pick up. So, be holy, for I am holy. <clears throat> the Holy One has called us. Be holy. Be holy. to you as living stones built up and fit together come fill your holy house oh God abide within forever the called us be holy be holy for I am holy be holy for I am holy and after class, we'll uh, sing number 529, 529. All right, if you want to be turning in your Bibles to 
Ephesians chapter 6, that's where we'll be picking up again this evening as we continue to talk about the reality of this war that we are in and uh, how important it is to recognize that we are very much in a spiritual conflict, a spiritual warfare that God says we need to be both aware of and prepared for. Uh, if we're going to be able to accomplish what he would have us to accomplish. And so uh, tonight uh, we're moving on to the second piece of the armor that he talks about. We're going to talk about the breastplate of righteousness. If you'll pick up with me again, uh, starting in verse 10, we're just going to go ahead and read down through this section again, where we read, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And so as Paul is talking, and we've been talking about this, I want to kind of start this way tonight. Because the breastplate of righteousness, uh, the, the breastplate in a Roman soldier's uh, I sort of say uniform, it's really, I guess, his armor, uh, not so much uniform, but the breastplate was probably the most protective, personally the most protective part that he had. It was intended to protect all the vital organs. And so you've got this breastplate, and, and they, they looked really very similar to uh, just, uh, obviously we have a very, very modern version, but if you see a bulletproof vest, the ones that have uh, flap in the back, flap in the front, they, they kind of tie on the sides. They've got less protection here than they do here and here, front and back. And, and so that breastplate of righteousness would have, or I mean that breastplate would have that protection for them, but that was to protect the heart, the lungs, uh, any of the, uh, the vital organs. And, and probably most particularly as we think about the breastplate of righteousness that we're going to be looking at tonight, the concept of protecting the heart is really an absolute key, I think, in understanding what is going on. So as we're thinking about that protection, let me just ask this. What are some things you do to protect yourself and your children? We understand the concept of protection. How important is that? Tell me some of the things you do to protect yourself, to protect your children. Lock the door, which is interesting because we're in a different culture now than we were 50 years ago, are we not? I don't recall ever locking the doors to our house when I was growing up. Uh, you just didn't lock the doors. That wasn't typical. Matter of fact, we didn't have air conditioning, so not only you not lock the doors, windows are all open while you're, while you're in bed at sleep. Larry? Yeah, yeah, great point. The, the idea of, think in terms of the, the seat belt. I, the, you know, one comedian said they're really not to protect you, it's just to help the ambulance driver find you. But uh, let's hope that's not what they're for. Uh, there, there was a lot uh, of pushback against seatbelts being mandated. There's no question about that. Uh, but how many lives do you think seatbelts have saved over the years? A lot of lives have been saved because of uh, seatbelts. Uh, a, a very famous football player in Kansas City, because he was not seatbelted, lost his life and would not have lost it had he been seatbelted. Uh, he got ejected totally from the car and ended up losing his life. So it, it, it does save lives. And, and I can assure you, anybody that's ever been in an accident that was saved by their seatbelt probably appreciated that the government made them buckle the seatbelt. Because if you're like me, my guess is I would have gone, I, I might be doing it now, 
but I would have gone a long time if it was optional without buckling the seatbelt. I didn't buckle it because I was so personally concerned about my safety, but the government said you need to do that. Same way with helmet laws with uh, motorcycles and such. If if you don't, you don't wear, I mean, if you wear a helmet and you have a wreck and the helmet saves you, I'm thinking you're you're pretty appreciative of the fact that somebody said you need to have a helmet on. So we think in, in those kind of terms. Other things you do to protect yourself and your children. Yeah, absolutely. Think about the way we're dressed now. We look like a, a roller derby team to, you know, just, just getting out to go on a bicycle, you know, or a skateboard or whatever else. Other things you do. Yeah, Rob? Yeah, I, I mean, you're saying as far as how you're going or where you're going. Okay. Okay. Yes. So very, very cautious as to where we allow our children especially to go and where we even go ourselves. We understand that. There are places that are inherently safer and places that are inherently unsafer, are they not? I grew up in, in the Tampa area, and one of our favorite places to go eat was Ybor City. Ybor City, daytime, great place to go visit. Ybor City, nighttime, not where you want to be. It, it just had a different complexion at night. You were not as safe down there at night. I saw other hands. Yeah, let me go to Mike, and then I'll come up to Ken. Yeah, not putting off going to the doctor. Uh, you know, understanding we, we see something, we're, we're going to take care of that. Ken? Uh, absolutely. We, we monitor so that we're guarding more than just their lives, although it guards that as well, uh, but uh, guarding their hearts, guarding their minds. We're, we're very cautious about that. Other things? about all the things we teach them as far as proper ways to do things, proper uh, ways to, to execute different things. How, how, what, how do you behave or what do you do when you've, you've got a lawnmower, you know, when, you're, when you first get in a car? Uh, every one of our kids and our grandkids that are driving so far had 100% confidence they were ready to hop in a car and drive wherever you wanted them to drive before they had their license. I wasn't getting in with them, just telling you that. <laughs> they needed some training on, on, on that kind of stuff. Other things? I mean, think about all the things you keep them away from, Ken. Oh, absolutely. Vetting your kids' friends. It becomes very important to know who it is they're spending their time with. Uh, You know, there's just so many things we understand. Yes, Cindy? Yes, stranger danger. I mean, we, you know, again, a phrase that didn't even exist, maybe that should have, but it didn't exist when I was growing up. But that concept of trying to have the the children be aware. Uh, You think of even houses, you know, you got those plastic things that are a huge annoyance to adults that plug into outlets so that you, you, the child can't stick a knife or a finger or something in the outlet. You know, you can't get it back out again without prying a knife in or something. So uh, I'm not sure that's a safety move. But, uh, I, I mean, really, watching your children around stairs, watching your children around, uh, if you've got campfires, we just, we're very protective over them, and, and, and we understand that. And, and so we're trying to give them the tools so they can be safe. I think when we start talking about the breastplate of righteousness, there is more to this than just God trying to establish a morality in us when we think about righteousness. Uh, There's something that he wants to do with that. And I think this breastplate, somehow or another, and that's what we want to try and figure out tonight and see tonight, how is it that righteousness protects me? Not only how does it uh, help me uh, live the way that I should, not only how does it help me stay in fellowship with God, which is obviously protection in that sense, that I'm not going to have to face God from having lived a wrong life, but but how is it that it it protects me? Uh, We want to talk a little bit about that, because God wants us to be protected. He's given us armor so that we can be protected, and he tells us twice in this passage, every piece of the armor is necessary. He says, put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand in this fight. And and then later, a few verses later, he says, put on the whole armor of God, repeats the exact same phrase, so that we can have that ability to stand again. So that's what he's telling us. It it isn't just the the kind of person that they need to be. I think that it is considerably more more than that. He's going to talk about first, we girded ourselves with truth. 
And he talked about that's that belt that kind of it kind of holds everything together. The truth is absolutely critical. Everything else falls apart if you don't at least start uh, with the truth. And then he goes into this: the righteousness that is necessary to win the fight. Not just the righteousness that is necessary to get us to heaven. God expects us to live a certain way. It isn't, it isn't our righteousness inherent within us that gets us to heaven. We'll see that in a minute. But he does expect us to live a certain way. But I think he's talking about more than just the idea of he expects us to live that way. He's trying to get us to understand the way you live and the righteousness of life is in and of itself a part of the armor and is going to help prepare us for the fight that we are in. So righteousness is used two different ways. I want you to look at a couple of verses, get a couple of readers. Romans 4, verses 5 and 6. Romans 6, verses 10 through 14. All right, Stephen, tell me, you got the first one there? Okay. All right, so what's the, what's the sense in which righteousness is used there? That's not talking about the way we live there in Romans 4. That's talking about what God has done for us, is it not? The, the righteousness, the justification by the death of Christ. That's how we have been pronounced righteous because of what Jesus did on our behalf. And so we stand justified in God's sight, not because we earned that, but because Jesus died on our behalf. And so there is a righteousness in that sense in which God has bestowed on us because of what Jesus did. Now, we have to respond to God for him to bestow that on us. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying that's a part that God has bestowed. But look at Romans chapter 6, verses 10 through 14. Go ahead, Rick. So Roman, Romans 6 is now talking about the way I'm supposed to live. Uh, it tells me that, that Christ lived that way, but that's the way I'm supposed to live. And he says there, there should be, just like there was in Jesus, just like there was a death and, and a burial and a resurrection of Jesus, he's telling us in that sense in Romans 6, you remember he starts that chapter out by talking about that, that, that we have been baptized and that's how we were in fact put into the grave watery but raised in newness of life. But in this section that Rick was reading, it's saying, so how am I supposed to live? What am I supposed to do with my body? I am to present every part of myself to God, every member of my body, every aspect of who I am, present it to God as righteousness. And so he's saying, that's a life that now I'm trying to live. Not because it's going to earn me heaven. We understand that. Uh, Romans talks extensively uh, about the fact that God's grace is what provided the salvation, but it doesn't mean that God doesn't expect me to live or actually demand me live a certain way in order to maintain that contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and so he's saying, I, I need to live in, in a righteous way. Instruments of righteousness, not wickedness. So of those two uses, which do you think is the breastplate uh, of righteousness that he's talking about here? Yeah, there's, a, there's an aspect of both, but there's an aspect of put on that I think refers to this idea of, of what I am doing. Uh, now, I put on Christ, I understand, but uh, I think there's an aspect of him saying, when you're putting on the breastplate of righteousness, 
there, there's something about what I am doing and the life that he is asking me to live because he's already told them that they need to be a certain type of person. In, in, in Ephesians 4, he says, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That's Paul writing to the Ephesians. He's saying we need to put on a life of righteousness. Uh, so what does that mean? Righteousness means what to you? That's exactly what it is. It's, it's rightness. He's saying putting on a life that is doing what we're supposed to be doing. And it's interesting because God says in other places things like, look, you've had enough time to waste your life that way. We need to be living differently now. Isn't that what he tells us? God tells us, you know, you used to, you used to do these kinds of things. That, that's not the life as a Christian that you're supposed to be doing any longer. The idea of putting on the new self, that there's something I'm supposed to be doing by way of changing my life style. Uh, would we all agree with that? Become a Christian? Your lifestyle has a different focus, does it not? Even if you'd lived a basically good life up to that point. I mean, I, I didn't, so easy for me to see the contrast. I think sometimes it's harder to see the contrast if you were raised in a home of Christians and really striving to live right all along, and yet there's a motivation now. When I give my life to Christ, everything I'm doing is for Jesus Christ. And so I think he's telling that. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. And somebody read verses 11 and 12 there for me. Go ahead, Rob. You have man of God, keep these things in the true light. Love, faith, love, faith, and love. This life is this life of faith. Lay hold of the eternal life, which is also full of faith and faith. The good confession is the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as as Paul's writing to Timothy, what does he tell him? about righteousness it says pursue it what does that mean to you in other words how do we how do we use this breastplate that god is talking about because he's going to use some different terminology in the passage in ephesians 6 that we've already looked at that is our our main passage here he says put it on which tells you what i got to do something it's not inherently on me in that sense, I, I have to do something. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. He says, I, I, need, to, I need to execute something. Uh, Matthew 6, when he talks about righteousness, does, remember what he says? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek that. He says, because, and we understand that. That's in the context of what? Seeking righteousness in God versus seeking what? In Matthew 6. What's that? Yeah, I, I mean, I anything that has to do with us and our, and, and our self and taking care of self. And he's saying people get wrapped up in this world. We understand that. Do we all understand the concept of, of pursuing hard something that will allow us? What, let's, let's just start with maybe, maybe our schooling or, or our trade. We pursue schooling or we pursue a trade in order that we can do what? What's that? Earn a living. You know, and a, and a decent enough living that we don't have to be dependent on somebody else necessarily, right? And we're striving for that. Or, or we seek a certain job that we may be able to provide for ourselves better than we would have before. We understand the concept of pursuing something, do we not? When, when you, you get to somebody that is, is highly athletic and going to be uh, professional in whatever they're doing or an Olympic athlete or something of that sort or, or somebody that's going to be a, a professor or a, a doctor or somebody else they understand the concept of what it's going to take in that pursuit do they not gonna have to put a lot of effort into school gonna have to put a lot of effort into the sport whatever else it is that you're doing we understand the concept of pursuing something it, it's, it's interesting because we use that same uh, that same idea when we're doing some of the, the marriage stuff. Because when you look at the, the four principles that are in Genesis chapter 2, and you talk about leaving and clinging to, that cling to is the idea of pursuit. Hold fast to. 
And so we tell husbands and wives, even once you're married, you need to be pursuing each other. The pursuit is not over when you get married. You want to have a good, strong marriage, you pursue each other for the rest of your life. How, how do I pursue my spouse so that I can have that relationship? And so he's saying that. He's saying we need to have that kind of an attitude where like in 1 Timothy 6, he says, you know what? I'm, I'm going after this with some real vigor, some real effort. Give me an example of something else that he uses that would show us the concept of great effort or longing for associated with righteousness. Does that help? How about if you're in the uh, couples class? We're studying what in the couples class? Can anybody answer that? If, if, hopefully, do we have anybody in here that's coming to the couples class? We're studying what as a basis? What's that? The Beatitudes, right? As they apply to marriage. And so when you get to righteousness, what's the attitude he says to have? Hunger and thirst. In, in other words, there is a great longing for, he says, blessed. Not blessed are those who are righteous, although they, they would be blessed as well. But he's saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Uh, that, that idea of, of how important is it that we pursue it that way. And I think part of the reason is, he's saying is because it, it is a part of this protection that God gives us. And so in Timothy, what he was describing was the fight. Did you notice that in 1 Timothy 6? He's describing the fight. And he's telling Timothy to pursue the fight, but he says, pursue righteousness. You're in a fight spiritually? Pursue righteousness. It's going to provide you some protection that you need to do. So what we understand is, why is that so critical? Because it, it's, not, it, it's not just a system. Righteousness is not just the idea of, uh, of only keeping rules for the sake of, uh, of keeping rules. It, it is the method by which we're going to defend ourselves against attacks from Satan. I think that's the point of, of Ephesians 6. He's saying, you're going to find that how you live your life does a great deal to help protect you uh, against the attacks, uh, the attacks from Satan. Because what's Satan trying to do? He's attacking, he's undermining all the time. He wants to undermine pure living, does he not? He'd, he'd just like to get us to think a little bit differently about that. Would you agree with that? He just wants to try, and, and God is saying, you know what, the, the, have that righteousness. I've mentioned before that the first time I ever remember seeing, at least anywhere besides in the Bible, I probably read it before I saw it on the TV, but somebody had on their, their TV Job 31.1. Why should I look upon a young woman? They had that little thing right on there, and it said Job 31.1. They had that on their TV just saying, what was it telling them? Be careful what you watch. Turn it off if you have to turn it off. It, it was interesting because Judy and I had that discussion when uh, early on in, in, in our marriage because she made a comment that was so foreign to me in the environment I grew up in. It, it just it didn't register at all. She said, we had to ask to turn on the TV. I thought, good grief. What kind of family did you grow up in? Uh, I thought, man, I'm going to free you. But no, I'm just kidding. The, that, that was absolutely foreign to me. But I can assure you, there are a lot of times I turned on a TV that I'd have been better off not turning on a TV, and if I'd have had to get permission, I'd have been better off having to get permission and being denied. We understand that. There are, she had parents who were saying, not everything on TV is worthy of you seeing. And that, you know, this is back, I mean, you know, she was a kid in what, late 80s and 90s? Uh, you know, so, not quite. But, uh, you know, I'm saying a long time ago, it still wasn't safe. And, and so S Satan works that way. And, and he's saying, if you'll, if you'll make sure you're living a, a certain way, my, my obedience to the Lord, if I see that as armor, as, if I see that as protection for myself, because he wants to replace that which is moral with that which is immoral. It, it's Satan who would like me to have an attitude of greed or envy or hate or lust in the wrong way. Uh, it, it's Satan, any of those kind of, uh, those kind of vices. It, it's Satan that would have me laughing at sin rather than mourning over it. Would you agree with that? 
He just changes our whole attitude toward that. He wants me to rationalize my behavior rather than confess my behavior. That, that's the nature. So that's what he's constantly doing to us. God is saying, put righteousness in place. Live your life the right way. Focus on that. Work hard on that so that you can accomplish that. And, and I think that's the whole point uh, of James 4 when he says, R- resist the devil. And, and what happens? He'll flee. He's saying, you know what? Sometimes you've got to stand your ground. You've got to make the right decision and do the right thing. It's more than just that moral decision. It is me waging war against Satan. I'm going to do what's right because I need to do what's right in order to keep myself safe and keep myself protected, therefore keep my family protected as well. So first, it isn't just an issue of living morally. It includes that but it is me defending my position with God and against Satan. Secondly, it, righteousness is, is a, a, you might want to say it's a practice, not a perfection. In, in the sense that we're, we're constantly striving, and, and God tells us to continue to do that. He says everyone who practices righteousness, he's saying ongoing that you're, you're continuing to work on that, continuing to put forth the effort. That's what allowed Paul to say things like he, he was pushing on, but he hadn't achieved it yet. How, how important is it for me to keep in my mind that I, I've got to continue to work hard every single day uh, and continue to stay that way? Uh, First John tells us whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. It says whoever one who practices righteousness is born of him. We've got to put forth that effort. Rob? Yeah, I like the idea of what Satan did in the way that he was saying, but he originally said, so I'm not able to answer the question. The idea of we're under bondage to Satan, we're still under bondage to our father, and that's why we're in the world. Yeah, absolutely. All we did was switch masters. Uh, you know, you're, ne- you're not going to ever be free of a master. Jesus said that, either for me or against me. Ralph talked about that when he was here. I mean, that's the only two choices you get. So you're either for Jesus or you're for Satan. But you don't get a lot of other choices. Uh, God says you're on one side or, or the other. And, and so we have subjected ourselves uh, to God in, in that way. But then thirdly, I think God wants us to, to understand as well that we're compelled to live a righteous life because so m- God wants us to see clearly that so much of our pain in life comes from our lack of personal holiness. That, that will cause great grief in, in our lives. Think about David. I, I mean, there is no question. When David looked uh, and saw Bathsheba, here's a beautiful woman. He sees this beautiful woman bathing. There, there's all kinds of ideas now going through his mind. And, and, and it, it just seems like a good idea. M- my guess is... David enjoyed once he started watching her. That's that's just natural. David sent for her, brought her. When David had physical sexual relationship with her, there's no question in my mind that was pleasurable for David. So it seems like things that are good. Satan is gifted at making us feel like the bad choices are providing joy and good results. But it didn't really, did it? David's bad choices provided him way more grief than it ever did good. And how important is it to see that on the front end rather than the back end? That's what God's trying to get us to do. And so he's trying to get us to live a righteous life, not because he's trying to make your life harder. He's trying to make your life better. He wants us to to be able to have the kind of life that that is good and that is full of joy, uh, that that we can have the life that he's intended for us all along. So joy was not in unrighteousness, so much so that when David wrote Psalm 51, do you remember what he said? He said to the Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. He had lost that. He had lost that. He said, restore that to me. I need that, I need that joy back, and that joy comes from right relationship uh, with you. It's not in uh, unrighteousness. Uh, his joy was not found in, in this plunge into sexual immorality. His joy was found in, in coming back into the presence of the Lord. God just wants us to get that picture on the front end. 
That's where a lot of the protection comes from. Would you agree with that? If you understand the consequence before you make the decision, that will help you a lot of times make the right choice and not lose some of the joy that you could have. You know, how, how important is it? How many people are making bad choices because they don't know that it's going to end up where, where it's taking them? I'm saying in the world especially. How many people are making those choices? Ruining lives because they, they don't really think that it's going to ruin their life at, at that point. Uh, you know, so he just, he just wants us to understand some things. It doesn't just happen. I think he's saying we got to make a decision. If I'm going to put on the breastplate of righteousness, that is a very conscious decision that I'm going to do what's right. And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that is, is a big challenge to us. Sometimes we fail in that. And that's why he talks about practicing righteousness because even when I fail, I get back up and I don't lose faith. I keep pressing on and know I've got to work harder next time so I don't get beaten by the same thing next time. How many people have ever experienced that? Satan won because he, he had something that maybe caused you to think it wrongly, but you learned your lesson from it. You ever learned a lesson from failing? That's good. See, six of us have learned lessons. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, w we understand that. And we learn, uh, I'm better equipped to fight. God didn't, he'd prefer me not to fall. First John says he wrote the things that he wrote in order that we may not sin. But then he immediately turns around and says, but when you do, because he knows we're going we're gonna to make that mistake, we have the ability to come back and, and, and we can continue to gain that. So uh, just think about the relationship that we have. Came across this quote from Peter Kreeft, who's actually a uh, religious philosopher, if you will. Uh, he says, we cannot win any war first if we are blissfully sowing peace banners on the battlefield. If you are surprised to be told that our entire civilization is in crisis, then I welcome you back from your nice vacation on the moon. Many minds do seem moonstruck, puttering happily around the Titanic, blandly arranging the deck chairs. I just like that quote. I mean, he says that pretty straightforwardly, doesn't he? He's just saying, you know what? It's, it's a fight, people. We need to understand it's a fight, and, and we need to do that. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 through 6. Somebody read that for me. Because how are we going to start? We looked at how we start last week. How am I going to put on righteousness? What's the first thing necessary for me to live the way I'm supposed to live? Ah, there it is. And so we, start, we started last week with what? Girding yourself up with truth. And I think that's what he wants us to understand. Knowledge of God's work. When, when you looked at Proverbs 7, or if you look at Proverbs 7, and you see that man who was simple, part of his issue was he, had, he just didn't know. He, he was foolish. He didn't understand things that he should do. He says, we need to know the word of God. You want to do what's right? You need to know what's right. Seth, you want to go ahead and read that? First of four through six. And, and so what are we supposed to do? Every thought that comes in, what are we to do with it? Take it captive. It's interesting God doesn't say, don't think any of these things. Why do you think he tells us, don't ever have this thought? What's that? Yes. You, we don't have the capability of keeping thought from happening. And so thought comes in. He says, that, you know what? That's not the issue in and of itself. Thought comes into mind. He says, but now you're going to have to choose. Am I going to let it capture me? Am I going to capture it? He says, take those thoughts captive and do with them what God wants you to do. And so Satan puts that temptation in. The thought is there. And immediately you're saying, I can't do that because that's not what God wants me to do. And that's not how he wants me to live. And I'm going to make a different choice than that in my life. And so that's why he says things like in Ephesians 4. Don't give the devil a foothold. You know, the, the devil's kind of like that salesman. You know, he just wants to get the foot wedged in the door. You can't shut the door fast enough on him. It actually, that word carries the idea of a beachhead in Ephesians 4. Don't, if you let him land, people that understand warfare understand huge advantage to being able to land and take the beach, isn't there? 
you know, wars w are won that way. And, and he's saying, do not give Satan a, a, a beachhead that way. A couple more things, and then we'll be done with this one. Uh, so if we f fail to pursue righteousness, here's the things to think about. You're going to enter the battle unprepared. If I'm not s actively seeking righteousness, I am not equipped for the fight, and that's going to be problematic. I'm going to enter it unprotected. So unprepared, unprotected. If I'm not making an active seeking of righteousness. And so think about it this way, because Satan, Satan is just looking to get that little advantage. Without the breastplate of righteousness, we're not simply in danger of provoking the devil. We're in danger of joining him. I think that's what God wants to make sure we understand. You, you don't pursue righteousness the way that you should pursue righteousness. He says, just going to trust me, Satan's going to win that war. He's going to win that one. We end up on his side instead of on God's side. That, it is a very active and, and constant choice to be on the side of God and pursue the righteousness. But he says, when we do, look at the protection that provides me. As I continue to live right and know right, I have much more ability to fight against that which is wrong. Really appreciate everybody's comments tonight. Hopefully as we continue to move through these, uh, each item of armor, uh, it just gives you a, an opportunity uh, to think of each one in a special way and, and how we can use that uh, to the advantage God would have us to use it. If you're not armed with God, we'd love to help you take care of that tonight. If, he's, if Christ is not your Lord because you haven't confessed him as Lord, haven't chosen to be buried in baptism with him, we'd love to help you with that tonight. If you've never read that, let us show you in his word. That's not our... That's not our doing and asking that's that's what god asks about all of us to do we'd like to show you from his word that that's the case uh, so that you can turn from that past life and, and walk with god from that point forward for those of us that are christians maybe we understand every choice we make every day in regards to how i choose to live is going to go a long way in how well i can defend myself against the attacks of satan if we can help you respond to any of the things that god would have you do let us know while we, while we stand, while we stand. <laughs>
Um, a reminder to pray every day for Terry Mason and Ed and the family, and for our sister Laura Cantu. Is there anything else that needs to be mentioned? Rick. Thank you for being here, Sharon and Joey. Did you get to see the eclipse? Did you have a good, you probably, your view was probably a lot like ours. Yeah. It was good enough just to watch it get dark really quick, right? I mean, that was, that was enough excitement for me. <laughs> and then to reverse that. Okay, so have a safe trip. Thank you for being here. Anybody else? Okay, Heath, please bow. Heavenly Father, how truly great thou art. Your power and might, Father, has been on display over the past few days with the eclipse and with the storms that came rushing through and, and are racing its way to the, to the East Coast. Father, we know that you are in control of everything and that you do things um, at your will and you do them to benefit mankind, although sometimes, Father, we, we want to fight against this and and um, we don't understand it. But help us, Father, to, to yield to you and to understand that ultimately that we can place every care upon you and that we can rest on your promises and your great truths, Father. Help us to be true servants of yours as we look to the example of our Savior and how he lived, Father, how he overcame so many difficulties, Father, and not only overcame these difficulties through prayer and, and progress, but he found joy, Father, every day in serving you. We yearn, Father, to, to reach another plane in this life, to be able to do that. Help us, Father, to have joy in your service, to put ourselves last in all things, and to bring you honor and glory in all that we do. Comfort us, Father, as we leave here. We pray a special prayer for our sister Terry Mason and Laura Cantu, that you will be with them. Bring us back, Father, when we are to meet again, and once more for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who makes this very prayer possible. We give you our thanks, and we pray this in his name. Amen.